How about a, a does not equal sign? Yeah. <laughs> Doc does not equal Kruger. We can do that. A greater than. Yeah. It's a greater than sign. I have the PhD. <laughs> this week on Backward Compatible. In anticipation of Fire Emblem Fates, Jim, Doc, and Chris hold a roundtable discussion on Fire Emblem Awakening. Plus, we debut two new segments, Back Talk and Game Show. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. <laughs> Compatible. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 48 of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast. I'm Chris, and I'm joined tonight by Jim. Hey, and I'm here. And we're joined by Doc. I'm back. Woohoo. And our meaty topic of discussion for the evening is going to be a roundtable discussion on Fire Emblem Awakening for the 3DS. Um, not exactly a new game, but we thought it'd be interesting to talk about because Jim and I have both played it. And uh, Doc has not played it, so we thought we'd get him to try it out, see what he thought. Well, I have um, now. You forced me to. Yes, exactly. Um, and <laughs> we, then, we tied uh, him to a chair. Yeah. <laughs> we taped his eyelids open. Yep. We stuck the 3DS in his hands mm. and forced him to play. Yeah, the handcuffs are really not necessary, yeah. guys. And <laughs> Jim, Jim had the uh, unenviable task of having to do like the eye drops yeah. <laughs> every few seconds. Yeah. Oh, so. that was you? I couldn't tell. Yeah. <laughs> We put those horse blinders on so you couldn't really tell where it was coming from. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but something to kind of review the last major Fire Emblem release uh, in preparation for, or rather in anticipation for, uh, the new one that's going to be coming out relatively soon. So, uh, But before then, we have our opening segments. Uh, this time we are not opening with the button mosh, but with the gaming meta. This is the gaming meta. News and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. I was pleased to get a phone call this week. From GameStop. Um, now, I, I know I've had mixed things to say about GameStop in the past, and I've also implied things about them in the past, but in this case, they did a really cool thing. Um, they actually called Ubisoft into town at their corporate headquarters, and then they went through their files and found people who had uh, consistently reserved Assassin's Creed and uh, picked it up in midnight releases and things like that. Huh. Well, as it turns out, my account is one of those that has every single Assassin's Creed that's ever come out um, pre-ordered on reserve. Largely, this is to do with my father, who um, borrows <clears throat> my account in order to do this. But um, the truth is, I've played every single Assassin's Creed to date. I have uh, enjoyed most of them. My last favorite was four. But the new one that has just come out is called Syndicate. Uh, or rather, I should say, it's about to come out. Uh, now, we got to play a stable version of the game, so it was more than beta, and it was uh, kind of more of a pre-release thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what they did was they actually filmed us playing, got interviews with us playing, and um, this is the, you know, when you walk into a, a GameStop store, there's videos in the background that play, mm-hmm. and, and usually uh, interviews and that sort of thing. Well, that's what this was. This was them recording that. Very nice. So there was about 30 people or so, and allegedly, according to them, we were the first ones to ever play the game. The game that will be sold, the game that will be released. So uh, I have the proud designation of being one of 30 people to have played mm-hmm. that uh, particular one. Now, I would love to talk about the gameplay and some of the things that I really enjoyed about it. But the truth is, I'm not allowed to. Because as you might expect, I had to sign a non-disclosure. Now, is yeah. this fact that you signed an NDA part of the NDA? Are you not allowed to say that you signed a non-disclosure? Oh, no. In fact, we were, <laughs> we were allowed to talk about the experience and, and <clears throat> take pictures and do all kinds of things. We just couldn't take pictures of gameplay. Mm-hmm. We couldn't talk about gameplay. And we are not allowed to um, put anything on a public forum, such as the Internet, about gameplay. So not like a podcast, say? Right. Uh, that would be a perfect <laughs> example of what we're not allowed to do. Um, uh, they, they, they ran out of those little men in black uh, like eraser pens, that eraser memory. I have no recollection of this. Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably why. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but what I can say is that uh, they were really cool people, and I talked to the devs 
uh, about some of their processes and procedures from Ubi. They, you know, Montreal um, Canadians, so of course they were very polite. Mm-hmm. And uh, free maple syrup. Oh yeah. no! The, if uh, last night was any indication, Toronto Blue Jays versus Texas Rangers game five. Um, they're not very polite. <laughs> wow! Uh, but that is uh, another topic it's, for another time. It's not that kind of gaming show, Chris. <laughs> um, but what I was impressed with was the way that they. Um, Treated us, let's say. Uh, I got some temporary tattoos, so if either one of you guys wants an assassin uh, tattoo, just hit me up after oh, the show. Do you, do you have an Assassin's Creed tramp stamp now? Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> oh, oh, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Uh, it, it, a is for assassin. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's what AC stands for. Um, but uh, they also gave us. Well, they're basically uh, costume items. They're actually 17 plus toys, which mm, is interesting, cool. a- including. Um, the the gauntlet itself, mm-hmm. which in this version of the game, if you've seen the trailers, you know um, that there's uh, a sh- kind of a shot put thing that's a part of it. And then there's also, of course, the, the hidden blade that's always a part of it. And uh, as he's had for the last couple of uh, iterations, the main character has a... Um, a secret gun as well. So okay. all those things are just a part of it. So shot put? Yeah, like, um, you can get up to the top of a building very quickly, in other words. Oh, so it's like a type of grappling hook? Yeah, it's a grappling hook. Okay. 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 Yeah, that's, that's what I'm looking <laughs> I was say, shot put yeah, is shot like put. A, a field sport. Yeah, Olympics, <laughs> you have the big You're right. No, 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 no. Like, grappling hook is, uh, is the word I'm like looking for. It's like you can for. shoot cannons at people. But oh, I, was well, like, <laughs> I think you're probably thinking of like in Zelda, they've got the hook shot. Hook, hook shot. shot. There you go. Yeah, that's yeah. what it was. There you go. That makes that's what it was. But anyway, yeah, so there's a lot of really cool things about... Uh, the game that I'm looking forward to and I wish I could tell you about. So a quick, a quick thing that people already know about mm-hmm. um, before we wrap this segment up. Um, what are your thoughts on it being set in Victorian England? Well, you know, going into it, I was actually disappointed by this. I want them to go further back in time, not closer and closer to the present. Mm-hmm. Stone um, Age Assassin. Right. <laughs> um, no, I, I'm waiting for the Egypt one, personally. I think that would be fantastic. Oh, that would be cool, yeah. Uh, wow. yeah. But... Um, no, after playing it, I'm, I'm changing my tune. I think this is going to be uh, as good and revolutionary in various ways as... Um, I'm going to go ahead and say AC2, which was my all-time favorite. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm going to have to play it then. Yeah. Cool. This is Back Talk, where someone shares their thoughts on a previous discussion they missed. We're introducing a new segment known as Back Talk, and the idea is that if one of us misses an episode, like, for example, I missed podcast episode 46 and doc miss podcast 47 so uh the idea is that we can go back and we can talk about it on a later podcast just kind of give our thoughts mm-hmm. um so i'm going to do that for podcast 46 uh so they talked about uh you know changing tastes over time a little bit about nostalgia mature and what makes maturity in games um the few things that i wanted to to, to mention starting off it sort of tackled both topics um so I know y'all mentioned, for example, Chris talked some about Super Mario Bros. and the clunkiness of the original. And I think it's not so much that I that I that I I disagree with the word choice mm-hmm. mainly because clunky is not really the right word. It's like the way that the jumping worked in the original was actually quite different from the way that it works in the later mm-hmm. editions. But not clunky. In fact, the controls were actually are actually very tight, and they're made that they're made to mimic the way that someone actually jumps. And that's one of the things that is missing from a lot of, you know, indie titles where they try to do platformers is you can jump perfectly. You don't have that, like, human forward and forward and, and back motion that sort of feels a little bit more like physics. Uh, that was, like, one of the revolutions of mm. Super Mario Bros. That a lot that... And they carried it over into the later games, too, by the way, if you notice. It's just, in the first game, uh, the way that you jump is... It's a, it's a little bit different. It's not quite as floaty. Or I, I, in, in some ways, it's floatier. But it's just kind of a different presentation. So it's one of those things where if you're not used to it, it can really throw you off because you think, oh, this is going to play just like any other 2D Mario game, and it doesn't. Hmm. And that's why when the first one came out, I mean, when the second one came out, and then later the third one, you know, it's like they were very different. So going from the first one to that one was also the same sort of thing, same sort of like weird feeling. I agree the new, the new 2D style I think is an improvement. But I don't think clunky is the right word. That was just a subjective thing for me because I, yeah. I, as I mentioned in the podcast, I started with the newer ones, right? And so the old one feels clunky to yeah. me. Yeah, and I think I, I think it's more like it, a better way to say that would be it's different. It's presented in a different jumping style because clunky. Like, there's so many games that have like platformers that have clunkiness mm-hmm. to them. You can still go back to Super Mario, the original Super Mario Bros. and it's superior to a lot of mm-hmm. platformers that are out today. I, I would probably just call so. those bad. 
I would yeah. call it yeah. like that. Yeah, because well, <laughs> so, when I hear clunky, I like cl- clunky for clunky me is, is bad to me. Clunky but, for me is just kind of off in a way. That's it's fair. not something I can't get over, yeah. but it's just off. That's fair. The other one I was going to mention was, of course, Doc uh, mentioning Legend of Zelda and kind of the way that. And I think Legend of Zelda is a great example of a game that you can go back and play, and it still holds up very well. Like the original Metroid, we talked about this in other other editions. The original Metroid doesn't really hold up that well, even though it did some really cool things. But the original Legend of Zelda, I think, really still does. Um, I do think you're kind of missing out on not experiencing some of the other editions because they all add little extra things to the series. But, I mean, that's more of a personal choice. I deny everything. Um, <laughs> I do think the other, the other thing I wanted to mention was the concept of um, sort of like gaming relics and gaming history and the importance of going back and playing some of these games specifically just to understand where games came from and also to kind of relearn old concepts that we sort of dropped that maybe we could pick back up and possibly do better now. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of games that ex- were very much more experimental back in the retro days because they had, they had to be. Genres were not as defined as they are now. Mm-hmm. And some of these experimental ideas, maybe they didn't work out that well, but we could, we could now revisit them with all that we have learned. Not to mention that it's good to have an understanding of where games came from. Obviously, Legend of Zelda is one of the most re- revolutionary series because it really kind of started that action adventure motif, mm-hmm. and it's been copied in so many different ways over the years. And obviously, Super Mario Brothers is like one of the most in- influential games as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. The other topic I did want to mention was the idea of maturity in gaming, or what makes what makes for um, a mature gamer, I guess, gamers that are mature. And I kind of agreed with your final point, Doc, where you, you said it's more about recognizing what, you're, what you want to get out of it as opposed to just kind of blindly going in and, like, snacking on the candy, I think is some, a term y'all used. Mm. Yeah, game candy. Yeah. Game candy, yeah. yeah. Um, it's more about, it's not necessarily about those, any experiences being, like, only if they go for this, then it's wrong. It's more of a, you have to know what you're getting into kind of thing. But I think... I do think that when it comes to, um, you, you spend a lot of time talking about narrative and mature narrative and game developer story, mm-hmm. and I think while that's that's an interesting, you know, obviously I think there's nothing wrong with developer story in certain genres. I don't think you can really tie that to maturity of the game itself. Mm. I really think that's just another aspect of the game, and a game can be, for example, a game can be mature and have no developer story or no story at all. So I don't think it's necessarily immature. That. Like mm-hmm. something like Tetris, for example, is a very cerebral game that mm-hmm. has no story. So I think I, I do think it's important to make that distinction and not focus too much on narrative. Narrative, I think, is very important for some games, mm-hmm. but for other games, it's really not important at all. <clears throat> so not every game needs to have a story. Well, I think interestingly, though, Tetris is also one of those games that's considered all ages because yeah. it's sort of universal. Oh, yeah. Um, whereas games that you think of as being more mature or for kids tend to have a lot more of that context that helps differentiate. That's very true. Yeah, very true. Well, and Tetris is also a game that has been over-designed. Oh, and later that's on. A, that's oh, a different yeah. topic. Um, I agree with I'd you. I'd love to stick a pin in that one. Mm. No, I agree completely. But so We can talk uh, about at a later date. The original Tetris is as great as it is, and they mm-hmm. kept trying to fix it or like improve it. Just broke the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. we definitely need a Tetris episode. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's worth it. It's a big enough game. It's time to hashtag get wrecked with some talk about competitive multiplayer games. So, uh, Get Wrecked this week is about me getting wrecked more so than me wrecking other people. Uh, I gave uh, Metal Gear Online a try, the online component of Metal Gear Solid 5, which um, I believe we were talking a little bit about before, Jim, about how um, it was out, but I hadn't tried it out yet. Yes. It is a add-on download, but it's still, you launch it, you launch Metal Gear Solid 5, and then from the title screen, you select Metal Gear Online. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing that really threw me off... Um, when I first got started, and it's something actually, it seems really cool, and I'm looking forward to getting better at it. But uh, it definitely does take on more a feel of your traditional online shooter, well, with some Metal Gear twists. So you have a lot more people who are still doing the run and gun. They see someone, they shoot them. They keep running. They shoot someone else, and it turns into even though the game modes, the three main game modes that I've seen so far are, um, I think Bounty Hunter is what it's called. I'm not positive about that. Um, there's another one where you have an infiltration mission. Um, you have two sides, attackers and defenders. Attackers have non-lethal weapons and are trying to steal a thing and get it back to their um, return point. Mm-hmm. The defenders have lethal weapons and they're trying to take out the attackers. And once you're dead, you're dead permanently. Um, so it's a one-life sort of thing. 
Um, and then you've got another mode, which is kind of your typical capture the point, hold the point sort of thing. Um, so two of the three modes are pretty traditional online shooter modes. And as a result, they tend to start being played more like a typical online shooter. Now, this is very different for me because in Metal Gear Solid Five, my approach is very much take it slow, be deliberate, plan, line up my headshot with my trank gun so I can put the guy to sleep, mm-hmm. and then be very much in control of the situation. I think that's the approach that a lot of people yeah. have playing Metal Gear Solid. Mm-hmm. Um, and Metal Gear Online definitely does not have that feel. Because you've got a lot of other human players who are able to take advantage of a pretty open map, um, a very sort of like, there are a lot of obstacles, but there are a lot of different ways to approach any given point on the map. Are there a lot of snipers, like sniping from... Um, I actually haven't seen too much sniping. My my main problem so far has just been getting like run up from behind and just machine gunned in the back from two feet away. That sort of why thing. Doesn't, why don't they CQC you? Well, sometimes they do. Okay. Um, at least that. See, that is at least... That's Metal Gear. And, well, that's the other thing that I wanted to touch on, is that uh, the way you gain experience in this game, and you have to... I haven't even leveled up to the point yet where I'm allowed to change my loadout. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Um, so I'm just stuck with basically an assault rifle for my lethal package, and then, like, you know, I, I'm not sure what's in the non-lethal package Do you think you'll yet. see gameplay changes, though? I think we might. There might be some new modes, and I'm also curious to see if... As you start getting more people who've played long enough to get better, if you start to see more strategic approaches to mm-hmm. the to gameplay. Well, let me reword, reword my question. Mm-hmm. What I mean is, as you level up, are you going to be paired up with people who are also more advanced? Mm-hmm. Is is there an advanced um, pairing system based on your level? So that you're not really even going to be exposed to the different play mm-hmm. styles until people have the loadouts that mm-hmm. make it even possible. That I don't know. I've just been doing auto-assign, and I imagine, too, that there are ways you can select specific matches with specific um, uh, parameters. But so far, um, mostly I've seen people that are around my level a little bit higher, and then your occasional one or two people who are, like, level 31 inexplicably when you're level 1. Um, <laughs> that always seems to happen, doesn't yeah. it? But the the point being, just to kind of put a wrap on this real quick, um, I, I suck at it so far. Uh, but I'm very excited to keep playing more. Um, I'm very intrigued by it because they do a lot of things that they add a Metal Gear touch that a lot of other shooters don't have that intrigue me. The fact that you can mark enemies for your teammates, uh, the fact that stealth actually matters in this game, um, that you get experience for doing things like fultoning people and not necessarily just shooting them in the head. Um, it's a very intriguing thing that I'm curious to see how it pans out as more people get involved. I want to hear more about this. I'm... Looking forward to what you have to say about it. On a future Get Wrecked. <laughs> yeah, it sounds actually pretty interesting. I should check out the online element when I get a chance. We should team up. Yeah. There can you, can you do that? Can you, like... Mm, I'm pretty sure you can. You can form parties. Okay, cool. Um, apparently, also, the uh, FOBs, um, apparently you can actually ally with specific players. Mm-hmm. So if you did want to try that aspect, like the semi-online mode in the single player, um, you and I could team up to defend and each like- other's bases. Oh, and like right, like raid FOBs or something. Uh, I don't know. You can do if you can raid simultaneously, but you can basically have friends and foes. Okay. And so, say I think, for instance, if someone raids my base, you would see that, and you could go retaliate against them, and oh. vice versa. Like I could do that for you as well. Okay. Cool. Or even help to defend. Sounds like Farmville. Kinda. <laughs> well, <laughs> with more with more guns and and soldiery talk and that's cigars. how I played Farmville. Oh, okay. <laughs> It's time for Game Show, where the backward compatible crew play a game show kind of game on their gaming show. What sort of crazy game show challenges in store this week on Game Show? Let's find out right now on Game Show. It's a new concept. We don't really have a, a solid name yet for it. But the idea is that I'm going to read a, um, a topic, and then I'm going to present... Um, Doc and Chris with little cards, pro and con. One's going to be pro, one's going to be con. They don't even know the topic yet. <laughs> it's going to be the fun. So they'll be, they will present their um, argument in two minutes, and the idea they will be is that they will be scored on by me in a completely objective uh, system, <laughs> very scientific, uh, on how informative they, they were, um, how persuasive they were, and um, their conviction, their level of conviction to it. Is there an objective measurement for conviction? I'm, I'm honestly, these are going to be ridiculous <laughs> scores. I'm probably going to be getting like you know a hundred or something. It'll be ridiculously. You'll high. get ten out of ten, and you'll get five completely, pineapples out of seven yeah, pineapples. Completely by the gut kind of scoring. Excellent. Yes. So, um, all right, let's go ahead and get started. I'm assigning these cards on purpose. So here we go. Oh, it wasn't randomized. It was actually no. Okay. On purpose. That's the that's, wow. That's part of the fun. All right. It's randomized for you guys because you don't know the topic. Okay. Um, so here we go. 
So Doc is pro, and Chris will be con. So I'm going to read the sentence. And if Meaning I'm in the it. industry and you're a hardened criminal. There we yes. go. As an entertainment medium, video games are unique in that they provide for and rely on interactivity from their audience. Therefore, the ultimate expression of games as art should embrace interaction and player agency and eschew developer narrative, cutscenes, and any on-rails elements. Now, I presented this question, and on, I mean, this topic on purpose is extremely binary, <laughs> even though I don't believe that it is, because it's more fun that way. So the crux of the argument is we're arguing for or against the idea that the game should eschew those things. You're agreeing with my statement, or you're disagreeing. You're disagreeing with my statement. Doc is agreeing with my statement. Mm. So what we'll do now, as I think we'll have like a slight cut in mm-hmm. the... Um, you know, podcast for y'all to like mm. prepare over the next, we'll say like three, four minutes. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're, we're back in. So our, uh, our steam panel has been, has prepped. Mm-hmm. They're ready to go. They're ready to face off. Um, okay. So we're going to start with pro pro is going to have a minute and 30 seconds to talk, to present their case. Then con will immediately get to respond two minutes to respond. And then we'll go back to pro to finish it off. Uh, and give us a 30-second uh, response if they have any to con. You don't Got have it. to use that extra 30 seconds if you don't want to. Oh, no, I want to. Okay. Because <laughs> Chris is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't even said anything yet, but he is wrong. All right, well, no argument, no, no statements before we start. Are oh. you ready? <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you when to go. Are you yeah. ready? Oh, yeah. Okay. Begin. Okay, well, the statement that you gave very obviously comes down to a authenticity versus validity type of argument. What we're talking about here is giving control, narrative authority, if you will, over to the player. This is absolutely essential. What I think people have forgotten about is that games, video games came out of a state of not having a narrative at all, or the narrative that was there was simply a hook. It was just Uh, a a very short go save the princess and the experience and this is the key word here because it is an interactive medium the experience that we had in saving the princess going through the levels doing the things in the order that we wanted to in the sequence we wanted to in the way we wanted to learning as we went was about the player not about the uh, so-called avatar the so-called uh, character. We didn't care about Mario. Just, we don't even know who Mario really is. Uh, what I know is that I am Mario. I am Link. <laughs> That's what's important. So whenever we get to modern iterations like Minecraft, there's a reason why that's one of the most successful games that's ever been. It's because the thing doesn't have a plot. It doesn't need one. So whenever we look at things like Telltale, who are about to do the Minecraft stories... I think it's going to be an utter and complete failure. And we can understand why. Okay. Time is up. Okay. Um, Chris, you're con. You have two full minutes. Go. Uh, My esteemed opponent uh, seemed to focus a little bit too much, I believe, on um, developer narrative. The idea that there's a story adding context to the games. My understanding of the question told me that we're also looking not just at developer story, but also at the openness of the systems and the ability of the player to affect the game. Um, the problem is that if you give too much openness in a game, it turns less from a game and more into a sandbox. And a sandbox can be fun, but it's really more of a toy than a game. Uh, a game has rules, a game has a win condition, it has a loss condition. Uh, therefore, if we're looking at those things as what defines a game, a game is also something which systematically simulates something, even if it's a very abstract idea. But you have rules in place that are meant to guide the player in what they are and are not allowed to do within the confines of the rules in order to achieve a stated goal. What that goal is and how they are able to achieve that goal very much define what the game is. Um, <clears throat> and therefore... The more complex a game is, uh, the more you need to add a little bit of context, especially if that context helps them to understand said rules. For example, if you're trying to uh, play a medieval game where the goal is to have the most money versus taking over the kingdom, that's going to very much affect your strategy and it's going to affect where your priorities are. Um, The other problem that we have is the infinite shelf problem. Players don't really know what they want. Uh, A developer needs to tell them, here's why you should be interested in this game. Here are the things that you can do in this game. And here we're going to show you generally how to do it, even if we're not holding your hand the entire time. We are showing you the player through the context that we've established, through the things that we've decided ought to be in the game and ought not to be in the game, how the game should be played for maximum enjoyment, as opposed to having the players... If the player can do anything, they won't do anything. Hmm. Because 
if you give them uh, the the classic example is if you go to the grocery store and you go to buy a, some jam or some jelly and you have 200 different flavors, you're going to be paralyzed and not know what you want. You got to narrow it down to the five flavors to say of these five, here's the choice that I want okay. for these reasons. Okay, Doc, you have 30 seconds to respond starting now. My opponent said something that is extremely key. He said the word simulation. The problem here is that what he was describing was not a game at all. It was an interactive film with decision points. If what you're really interested in is something that allows you to press X not to die, then absolutely. (laughs) But whenever he said that players don't know what they want, that's a deeply offensive statement, especially for someone who plays video games. And it's an irrelevant statement because we do. I'm so sorry, Chris. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's the point of the game. No, 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 no. That's, that's the fun. That's okay. the fun. We're also not taking this entirely seriously. Okay, Because I think both of you and I agree that you need a balance. <laughs> so The whole point of this is to present it in an extremely binary, one-sided way, even yeah. though it's, it's not, this is a very, like, nuanced topic. I think he's trying to break us up. <laughs> It's, um, it's now it's going to be Doc Semicolon Kruger. Yeah, that's right. And we have like a okay. little die for the dot on the semicolon. <laughs> slash. <laughs> I want a slash. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. Um, Let me guess. I have to be on the bottom, don't I? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Doc over Kruger. <laughs> Doc over Kruger. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, so, so, much, so much fodder for the stinger that today. <laughs> how about, how about a, a does not equal sign? Yeah. There we go. Doc does not equal Kruger. <laughs> You can do that. A greater than. Yeah. It's a greater than sign. I have the PhD. <laughs> <laughs> so scoring, um, both of you, I think, did really well. Of course, course you did. presented yourselves very well. We're awesome. Um, informative, Doc. Out of a hundred, I gave you ninety. 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 Yes. Okay. Uh, Chris, I also gave you ninety for informative. I think both both of you seemed to know what you were talking about. Had a lot of good information for conviction. This was pretty tough for me. So for conviction, um, Doc... You're convicted con, so that should be easy for you. Yeah. Doc, I gave you an 80. Mm. I, felt you had a, I felt you did have some strong conviction. Um, there, were, there were some times where it seemed to falter a bit or maybe, but just going by my gut, I feel like 80 was... You know what? That's a B minus. I'll take it. Yeah. Yeah. Any uh, day of the week. <laughs> Chris, I actually gave you an 80 as well. I felt, I, I felt as well that you had good, strong conviction in what you were talking about. Does he about. understand how scoring works? Since he's supposed to be different. He said it was arbitrary. Oh, so okay. It's arbitrary. <laughs> but now we get into persuasive. Who was the most persuasive? Well, who, got, who got what in terms of scoring for persuasive? So, um, Doc, I think especially uh, you had some strength in your persuasive argument, especially in the last little bit. So I went ahead and I gave you a 90 for persuasive. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Chris, uh, I'm sorry to say, but you, I only gave you a 70 in persuasive. Oh. There were some some parts of it that I think uh, you kind of you kind of lost me a bit along mm. the way. Um, still overall good, but you lost me a bit along the way. Fair enough. Um, and so that would be an 85 average for me and an 80 average for you, I believe. So I don't know if he's averaging or adding. Oh, oh I'm just adding him up. Oh, okay. So out of 300, Doc, your final score is 260. I'll take it. And Chris, your final score out of 300, 240. So this first round, this first game, goes to Doc, the winner. Woo-hoo! Now, are we, are we going to track points long term? I guess we could, oh, technically. Yeah. <laughs> are All we right. going to rotate who does it, or is it always going to be you, Jim? Uh, I guess we could rotate. Um, I do have several. We, we can each keep our own score. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, I do have definitely have several other ideas on tap. I do, too, to that's too, the so. thing. So. Okay. All right. Plus, so. Jim likes to argue. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, two minutes is going to be the hard part for me. Yeah. <laughs> This is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. I have a Mobile Minute this time, which I normally, I know I normally don't, but I recently got a new phone. and uh, So did I, I upgraded to Windows 10. <laughs> nice. Uh, but yeah, I'm using an, an Android device now, so I, I was exploring some of the, you know, Google Play Store. I found this interesting game known as Lifeline. And um, Lifeline is, is uh, a 99 cent game on the Google Play Store. And the way that the game works is essentially um, when you sign in, you're immediately contacted by um, someone that you don't know who they are, you don't know anything about them, and it's almost like they're kind of reaching out to anyone that will listen. Hmm. And so somehow they've managed to, to, to get into your phone and kind oh, of that's send the you information. Name. Yes, Lifeline. Uh-huh. So you start now, ta- is it a recorded message or like a live person? This is all text. Okay. And it, it is all text. It is essentially very, it's very similar to a 
instead of choose your own adventure, you're choosing their adventure. Oh, okay. So there's decision points. So it's all oh. taxes, and 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 they and he doesn't he types them out time based. So it's all kind of takes place in real time. So you know he'll start saying like, um, oh, I've I've crash landed on this planet, and so and so and so, and then you know where, what should I do now? And mm-hmm. you have two choices. And then whatever you choose, he'll react to it. It's actually written pretty, you know, fairly well. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you get choices like, um, do you want to go back and check a ship out for supplies, or do you want to go straight to like a tall peak and you know climb up and kind of see see the lay of the land? Mm-hmm. And you know, I chose to go to the ship, so now it's like you find um, you find one of your like his his captain like impaled by a big you know, part of a shrapnel or something. It's like, hey, do you want to pull that trap or not? You want to leave it in or mm-hmm. that kind of thing. So you have all these different decision points. And if you, you can also be kind of salty to him and then he'll <laughs> respond back to you kind of like in a snarky way. Huh. So it's kind of, it's kind of this interesting interplay. And, and, and he'll do things like, for example, he'll say, if, if you tell him to do something that takes time, like walk to a ship, um, he'll say, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to start doing that. And then he'll say, uh, like Taylor is busy. And then you just wait. And now it's like, it, it, he he'll contact you again when he gets there. So, like for example, when I told him to go to the ship, he didn't contact me back until like an hour and a half later, and then I could continue playing the game. But I have to wait until he does his actions before now, I can keep. Oh, so I, it's I, a real time, right? So, before oh, I can do a so, so real time and not even like when the app's open. Yes, it's always cool. happening. And he sends notifications. In fact, I'm sure he did mm-hmm. in the middle of this, and he's waiting for a decision point. So what happens if he's in like a life or death situation and you don't get back to him until the next day? Does he just die? Yeah, that's the one thing. It seems like it's once you get to a decision point, it's kind of on pause. Mm-hmm. So and even though like once you start, he'll he'll send out his um, responses and they'll take like a few seconds to come up because like it's like he's texting them out or yeah. something. Like a little dot 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 so and yes. so's writing. It literally, yeah. it literally does that, yeah. yeah that's kinda cool. And and then um, if it's if it takes some time to do something, like if he has to go find something in a ship or something like that, or he's set, he's hooking something up or he's installing something, then you'll get that busy notification. Mm-hmm. Then it'll take a certain length of time before he's ready. Um, I heard from uh, one of the guys in my office who actually uh, pointed this game out to me. And he said that it usually it can take a, a couple of days to run through. Mm. So it's apparently a, a short experience, mm-hmm. but it's very interesting. I actually, I actually highly recommend it. It's called a Lifeline. Once again, it might mm-hmm. be on iOS devices too. I'm not sure, but I know it's on the. the actually, Play it Store. is, and not only that, but there's a Lifeline too. And I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. This is actually inspiring me. I want to play it now because I have some other ideas of how you could apply the real time thing. Yeah. For example, uh, if there's like a decision you need to make quickly and you don't respond for a few minutes, he makes his own decision. Yeah. But based on what you've told them before. Yeah. That could be really cool. So like, here's what they would probably do in this situation. I can hear the devs now going, "No, <laughs> <laughs> no, we can't code that. No, <laughs> that would that would be a challenge." Well, what you would do is sort of like take do the like the risky thing or the safe thing for example yeah and then it's like they've been telling me to do the risky thing most of the time yeah, you just have to come up with a metric but mm-hmm. the danger i think would be making it binary yeah suddenly you're riding towards the mechanic you're not yeah exactly you know. and this was more like do the just, paragon thing do the renegade thing yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely even though there's only two choices it definitely comes across as though you're having a conversation with this person it's just, of course, he's very willing to do what you say, but it kind of makes sense when he tells you his backstory at the start, like who he is. Mm-hmm. He's just a student on this mission, and all of the trainers, like he's on this other planet or something, and all these, all these other, you know, all of his trainers and all that, he was never supposed to be left alone, untended. So he's, that's why he's so willing to listen to all of your ideas. Sounds like kind of a pansy. I don't know. <laughs> well, but he'll also, if you, if you kind of treat him like a jerk, he'll kind of... I'll kind of oh, really? come back at you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's it's a buck, so I'm gonna give yeah. it a try. I think it's I think it's worth playing. So, nice. All right, so we're gonna move right along into our roundtable discussion, Fire Emblem Awakening. Well, all right. Uh, this was a game that came out. Uh, was it uh, middle of last year? Oh, it's, it's been longer than that. Um, longer. 1992, um, 2012, or 20, 2013 in North America. That's what I thought. Yeah, February 2013. I didn't think it was more more than two years. Okay, it was Japan. Okay, 2012. So it's it's, a, it's two years old, and they're they're recently they're going to come out with a new one uh, pretty soon. I believe it's already out in Japan, but we're just waiting for it over here. Localization, um, yeah, and it is a uh, tactical RPG. It's been a series that's been running ever since uh, all, all the way back to the Famicom, which was the uh, the NES here in the U.S. We never got it in the fa- on the Famicom. We had to wait until the Game Boy Advance uh, version. We got our Fire Emblem. No numbers. Anything was Fire Emblem Seven, right? Exactly. Which was a prequel to Six. Yes. 
It's interesting, <laughs> yeah. And I think, um, but but the real important part of this roundtable discussion really is to get Doc's thoughts because I know I've been playing the series for a while, and I know Chris is has been playing it as well. Yep. So we're fans mm-hmm. of the series, but Doc kind of came at it from a different angle. Didn't seem like he liked it quite as well, much. Well, no, I, I'm the newbie for starters, <laughs> and which might be worth mentioning. Part of the reason we picked Awakening was because it was a game that was meant to revitalize the series, to potentially yes. bring in new audiences. Mm-hmm. So we figured it might be interesting to have a new audience. Which, by the way, I hear it did. It actually was mm-hmm. very successful. Yeah, it, it, thought, it saved the series. Yeah, it saved the series. So it actually did bring in a new audience. However, it doesn't necessarily mean everybody's going to like it. Sure. And I think... So, Doc, just to kind of give us a primer, do you have experience playing tactical RPGs? I do. Is yeah. that are are those the sort of games? Do you like to play those games a lot, or is that just um, kind of the games that you've played occasionally and thought they were okay? I've played them occasionally. I, I would say that it was a game that I I played a type of game that I played a lot about ten years ago. Mm-hmm. Really enjoyed about ten years ago. Um, so, which, which game in particular? Oh well, um, the Shining series was always uh, one of my favorites, mm-hmm. and um, depending on how far you stretch the genre, I, my, my favorite Fallout was actually Fallout. Brotherhood of Steel tactics. Yeah, Fallout tactics. So, um, and I've played a few of the other tactics too, Final Fantasy tactics and some of those. But um, what I really like about any kind of a grid-based thing is that it mimics tabletop. And so tabletop tactical games Mm -hmm. I have enjoyed very much. I liked the old Star Wars miniatures. I I liked... uh, D and D miniatures, that kind of a thing. And this one, I do think does mimic Fire Emblem. I do believe mimics uh, tabletop gaming quite as a, bit. a it's, series. It's very I think you're stat, probably right. It is very stat driven. Mm-hmm. Um, what my 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 broad stance on this? Okay, just talking about the genre mm-hmm. um, is whenever I sit down across the table to play a role playing game with somebody, a story driven role playing game, the last thing that I want to be focusing on is combat. I want combat to be a mechanic that's in there if I need it. Mm -hmm. Um, Fighting can be a thing that we can do. But the last thing that I want to be playing is a game where I grind through dungeons in order to get loot and level up my character. That, to me, is a board game. So there are lots of great board games that do this. Descent was a great one. Um, The D&D board game series, they're really great at this. And Doom was one of my favorites. But... um, yeah. John Carmack. You know, America. whenever you translate that back into... I see what you did <laughs> yeah. there. Uh, when you translate that back into a video game experience, then it should be doing some things very, very specifically. Um, the first thing it should be doing is it should be speeding up the process. It should make it so that you've got uh, something that can happen in 10 minutes that would take an evening to play because you've abstracted out all the math and that kind of a thing into a video game system. Alternatively, what it can do is it can put quest mode in back into your hands. And it can actually make it so that the narrative is compelling again. Um, if you've got something like Warhammer Quest and you play through all of that, it's going to take you weeks and weeks and weeks to play through that. Download the app and you can play through that interesting little procedurally generated story uh, very quickly and in a weekend. I think I think one thing, you're, and I, these are all really good points, but I think one thing that you're missing is that a big draw of this series is actually... The way the battle system works. Okay, the so let's talk so it's about kind of like let's talk about the yeah, series. It focuses on, um, I don't want to say I don't want to say chess, but it is like the, the, the idea is you in this grid based system. You have certain troops that are better at certain things than others. Rock paper scissors them. actually would be yeah. Good. Rock paper scissors is yeah. a better comparison, but I mean I was going with the grid well, system. As well, there are three things I didn't like about Awakening specifically. Okay, uh, the first is it exists in a niche genre, which is not for me. Yeah. All right. So we can talk about that. The second thing is um, the gameplay mechanics themselves seemed really shallow to me. And then the third thing is that the story itself was superfluous at best. So which of those three uh, toxic topics would you like no, to begin with? Let's talk about them all, but let's preface it in, in, with the understanding that you only played three chapters. Well, that's true. So, because the gameplay gets progressively more, um, they add more and more complexity to it as you go on. They ease you into it. Mm-hmm. And to an extent, I think it actually kind of does it a little bit of a disservice because um, I wouldn't say it babies you so much, but uh, for me, I got a little frustrated early on in the game because I, I, since I've played other Fire Emblems, I was ready to go right out the gate. And um, it, it was very frustrating. To, I knew what they were doing. I knew that they were easing me into it, but I wanted to go ahead and just start right away. Well, but you already said that, that this was intended to ease in new players, yes, exactly. right? I'm just saying that's pro- that's possibly okay. why I can understand because I think well, but part of it is like when I say ease when we were talking about it to ease in new players, I don't think it was ever meant to you've never played and have no interest in tactical RPGs, so now play this one. It's more like 
you're kind of a fan of this style of game, even if maybe you've never played this sort of game, mm-hmm. and so you're more you're more likely to get into it. But I am a fan of this style of game, and I'm saying well, ten, it was shallow. Ten years ago, Adam was a fan of this style of game. Okay, fair enough. That's, that's I, think, I think, I think that's a very valid point. Maybe if you had played this ten years ago, especially when you have more patience to sit through some of that, that earlier stuff to get to the later parts. To be fair, I've been playing a lot of Loot and Legends, which is yeah. an app that is... Very samey and, and extremely shallow, mm-hmm. and I'm absolutely loving the just smattering of story that's on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't feel in, insulted by it, and that's kind of one of my main points. Actually, is I, I feel a little bit slapped across the face with this one. Yeah, the story. I guess we can talk some about the story as well. And the story to me um, is to me it's more like it's just kind of there in the background. It's an and, afterthought. Yeah, and it's very much. I mean, there's definitely parts of the story that I found. Um, they tried to do something here and there, but I found myself not really caring about the story. Um, honestly, the only Fire Emblem that I kind of enjoyed the story was, I guess, um, uh, what was it called? Was it Path of Radiance was the first one? Path of Radiance on GameCube, yeah. yeah. And then Radiant Dawn was the Wii sequel. Yeah, so those were the ones, I mean, I, I, and, more, and more so Path of Radiance that I actually kind of cared, and that was more about, really just because I thought Ike had an interesting story mm-hmm. arc, and that was kind of it and then with radiant dawn i mm-hmm. thought so had a pretty good or is it so they're so they so the thief soth is how soth. i pronounced it but he kind of had sure. an interesting story arc too but mm-hmm. this one i just kind of felt like the characters were a lot shallower mm-hmm. um i didn't really care as much about the story but at the same time that sort of i've never really played fire Emblem for the story to be honest mm-hmm. i kind of like that style of um you know tactical play and ba- mainly it's more for me it's less it's honestly even less about the actual, you're inside the battle and you're trying to figure out the best way to approach it. That's part of it. But for me, it's more about like developing my team and developing the perfect team. And and I'll, I'll straight up say it, I like grinding. I actually like grinding. Sure. So it's like I like developing the perfect team, figuring out all my skills, learning all my skills, and learning how, how those skills complement my mm-hmm. troops. And the matchup mechanic, I bet, was one of the things that you absolutely loved. Yeah. Yeah. See, I can see that. Mm-hmm. Here's the problem I had. I actually am totally okay with the idea of a shallow, um, generic story, if that's what we're going to accept. This this game has a shallow, generic story, but the, the mechanics are fantastic, so go for it. The problem is this. That story, which was so generic, was heavy-handed. Oh, well, definitely. It's, here, here's a, here's a cutscene. No argument. We want you to swallow this. Now swallow mm-hmm. this. Now swallow mm-hmm. this. Who's this new character showing up? It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Swallow this. And, and there is a skip button. Cram, there is, there is cram, a skip button. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cram. You can skip all that if you want to. Oh, I know, but mm-hmm. I'm hitting the skip button 32 times yeah. just to get yeah. to the... I, I do think, and part of it too, is like, for me, and I, and I know y'all talked a little bit about um, anime as well last week on the podcast, but... Um, both Chris and I had a, more experience in the past uh, with anime, so this Fire Emblem relies a lot on anime conventions, mm-hmm. and so it's almost like and almost not even necessarily anime, but like this does tie it together. But J- specifically, JRPG yeah, specifically like JRPG conventions, but also which are very heavily reliant on shonen yeah. anime, specifically yeah. shonen anime. Mm-hmm. And so, if you have a background in shonen anime, and at least you have some sort of to, to, again, to use one of y'all's terms from last week, nostalgia, nostalgia goggles mm-hmm. for nostalgia shonen goggles. anime, which I admit many of it is frankly not good. Or even you could but, say uh, you've been desensitized to it. Yes. So <laughs> you you sort of you sort of see some of the Fire Emblem stuff, and you just kind of like to me, I just sort of chuckle at it or think it's like, uh, it's kind of mm-hmm. you know, it's corny, it's campy, it's not really good, but it kind of you know reminds you like mm-hmm. one of the points y'all made. It kind of brings back mm-hmm. little memories of of, mm-hmm. of enjoying those sort of shows. Mm-hmm. Those something, sort of programs. Something else too about that is that the characters are all um, very archetypal. Yes, um, and I think and, it's because and specifically of the sh- the, the shown anime yeah. archetype, not so much Western mm-hmm. archetype. Either. See, that um, makes sense to me. But but yeah. e- each character is very much like this is their shtick. Yeah, because what they want you to do is sort of find your favorite characters among the cast, and so what they're looking for is well, some characters might have some more nuances than others. For the most part, it's like this is the character that everyone ignores. This is the character that is very stern and strict, and this is the character that's hey, fun, you know, sarcastic all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and they cast a pretty wide net. They try yeah. to get, they try to hit like every stereotype or yeah. every archetype, rather. Yeah, um, and so that's something about it too is that they do present it sort of again. You said heavy-handed, but at the same time, they don't really spend a lot of time developing each individual character and they kind of like very quickly do something heavy-handed to tell you okay this is what this character is now you know go 
that sort of thing. Well, see, when you explain it that way, it makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. And it actually reinforces what I said earlier, which yeah. is that it's a niche genre that's not for me. Mm-hmm. I, I really have no interest in those types of... Um, I, I'll, I'll acknowledge what you're saying, Jim, and, and go with the subgenre mm-hmm. of anime. Um, now, I'm not a huge fan of anime in toto, but there have been a few that I've watched that I've enjoyed and that sort of a thing. So mm-hmm. you're... You're challenging me on my former statement, which is uh, that you know, I don't like anime at all uh, and making me think about that. But um, at least in this specific thing, this subgenre, what you called what? Shonen. Shonen. Okay. Basically, it's, it's usually action-oriented, um, anime specifically targeted to, to young boys, mm-hmm. in quotation marks, because it's actually enjoyed by... I think I have like by, 12 to 15 demographics. Yeah, except it's actually enjoyed by older boy, older guys as well. Mm-hmm. But it's that's sort of the demographic. So okay. it, it all has these these stereotypes. You watch any shonen genre, you'll find very similar so, ar- archetypes. And This is Japanese G.I. Joe, is what you're saying. In a sense. Actually, that's a pretty good comparison, yeah. Okay. I loved G.I. Joe as a kid, so you know what? Um, I can respect it. I, I was I really that kid can. that didn't like G.I. Joe. Really? Were you a Transformers man? I honestly didn't like Transformers that Oh, much man. Uh, you, you may have to leave my house now. <laughs> I played more video. I liked, I liked the toys, but I thought the show was just way too cheesy. Well, the show was just a big commercial for the toys. Exactly. <laughs> Literally. My, my TV was pretty much exclusively PBS. So. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. I played a lot of video games instead of... Like, was your family contributors? Uh, no. Oh, okay. I liked Real Ghostbusters. That was my hey, yeah. one of my favorite shows. Okay, so we've talked about the niche genre element and how it was not for me. Um, to be specific, it was the setting slash story elements that um, were of that genre. Those conventions just just didn't do it for mm-hmm. me. Uh, the the anime elements, and you're telling me it was shown in specifically. Yeah. Um, also, I didn't I didn't get that because I couldn't relate to it. Um, and then the one element of that that we haven't talked about is the 3DS hardware itself. Now, I've been playing on uh, Chris's loner, mm-hmm. which I appreciate. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've actually played three or four other games since then. Some are better than others. Did you try Kid Icarus? I know I loaned Kid Icarus yeah, to you. It's a very different experience. Very different, but I actually enjoyed yeah. that. Um, I think the biggest problem for me was the dual screen element of it. Now, I second screen all the time. You know, I'm sitting here with Hearthstone and watching TV. This is not a thing for me. Uh, but I actually played a couple of other games that um, just simply reversed which screen was the dominant screen and which screen was the heads-up screen. Mm-hmm. And in this case, the, the heads-up display was below, and the um, the higher-definition screen was the one that was being used for the um, you know the, the characters and that sort the of map, thing. Yeah. The map, yeah. Um, and, and when it was reversed, I actually found that I was using both of the screens. So that, that may just be a literacy thing mm-hmm. for me. Mm-hmm. If I when I get to uh, where I remember that the touchscreen is down there and I can use it, um, I might I might actually just find that element a little easier to do. Um, the the discomfort of holding it. I again I recognize there have been different models and, and some of them are more ergonomic than others and I have big hands and that sort of a thing. But um, so I, I can't pick on Awakening for that uh, for being you know a game that's on the 3ds. But what what I can say is um, that it is not my preferred system. Mm-hmm. Um, I just I haven't enjoyed the 3ds the way I've enjoyed other handhelds. Um, anyway, that said, the the mechanics themselves, which is of course different from the hardware, mm-hmm. I had difficulty with them. Um, I found that the design was meant to be slow paced. If you move your characters too quickly out into the battlefield, they will die. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, You're expected to like agonize over every decision. Right, and that's a design decision. Yeah. It to me uh, in tactical games is not something that I have particularly enjoyed. Yeah. So I would throw this out there: if the option to do that and to play characters that way um, is there, that's great. But if the other option is to kind of run and gun, that would be great as well. I, I, I really don't think Fire Emblem is suited to that. Mainly, although just, that said, as you level people up, once you get a really strong character. Um, which is very rewarding because it is so difficult to level them up and get them to survive that long. Mm-hmm. But once you get a really strong character, there's some characters you can throw into the middle of 20 people and they'll hold their own. You can. Um, it depends on... Yeah, you can get characters with really good... What is it? Like the dodge? Dodge and, dodge yeah, and countering. Um, yeah, the speed helps them to dodge and yeah. they have to have high armor too. If they do get hit, they don't take much. Interesting. There's yeah. things that you can do. I mean, it's like you can also put characters that are really... Um, tanky in doorways and like you know choke points, mm-hmm. and then use them to like soak damage, and then have people that have that can 
attack from two or more tiles away, stand behind him, and then just like take people out instead. So it's like you there's there's definitely like tactical a lot of tactical elements in the game, but you're right, it is really intended to be played at this very slow, agonizing pace. And you're supposed to like use you can you can do previews to see like how much like, by clicking on the enemies to see what their range is. In mm-hmm. other words, like how far they can move and also how far they can attack you from. So you move so just if, if you get used range. to that, you move just outside their range and then let them move to you and then plan it to... Yeah. So you have to kind of... But you have to really think about it and you have to prepare and there's certain battles where you can't, you, can't, you can't even do that because you're automatically in this enclosed space and they all can kind of already come at you so you have to be really careful who you put where. Well, I'll speak in terms of the holy gaming trinity, right? You've got your tank, you've got your DPS, and you've got your heals. Mm-hmm. There are yeah. definitely characters that are heals. And there are definitely characters that are DPS from the very beginning. But I didn't find that many tanks Mm. from the beginning. And so the difficulty I had was, from an MMO perspective, if you will, um, I always play a tank. Mm. That's that's my preferred gameplay. Um, And and so... Yeah, and this one is like, you have tanks, but you have two types of tanks. You have the ones that have high armor and the ones that have high, high speed, so they just dodge everything. Right. And so you want... And like... Again, these are sort of using conventions from a lot of Japanese role-playing game mm-hmm. conventions, where the, that's sort of where they're getting a lot of these character classes from. And there's really not... I wouldn't even say there's, like, pure DPS per se. There's, um, you know, ranged DPS, and then there's melee DPS. And those are pretty important distinctions in this game. Cause that's right. It's, like, very important distinctions, because where where you are um, located and, and being able to shoot, mul- like, hit someone from multiple tiles is really important. Um, are really useful, especially depending on your your situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway, so um, the gameplay mechanics themselves, like I said, I, I found them to be kind of kind of shallow. Um, but the real thing that was the clincher for me was a decision that I made from the very beginning uh, that was the wrong decision, and I turned on permadeath. Mm. That's the way you're supposed to play Fire Emblem. You play with permadeath, and if people die, you just accept it. But, but you the, never let them die. But that's the thing is. Uh, Mine kept dying all the time, and and there was some tactical element, and I and I still have yet to figure out what it is because it wasn't fun enough for me to go back and figure it out. Mm-hmm. Um, that uh, my characters just kept dying and kept dying and kept dying, and and so it it just stopped being fun. Uh, I was tempted to go back and turn off the death mechanic, which I knew was you know easy mode, mm-hmm. cheat mode. Um, they call it casual. Casual mode. You, you dirty casual. Yeah. yeah. Dirty casual. Dirty <laughs> casual. But it just wasn't It wasn't worth it. It mm-hmm. wasn't worth going and starting back over again, even though I was only at level, I don't know, like five or, five or six. I got to the castle, whatever mm-hmm. that was. And I think, um, and this is something we talked about while you were in the process of trying it out, yeah. um, that um, you were having a hard time figuring out whatever tactical thing you needed to figure out to keep people from dying. Um, and this was something that I think was... Uh, there were a lot of tutorials that were telling you things you need to know about the game and how to play it, but they were popping up on that bottom screen. On that bottom screen, that. yeah. They were. And, and, so, may, yeah, you and so you probably missed, missed a lot of tutorial things mm-hmm. so that would have helped you quite a bit. Because there's a lot of little things that you can do to keep... Like, you have a lot... You have a pretty varied party or army, I guess I should say, and many of them are very squishy. You have to be very careful about how you use them. And even the ones that seem like they're not squishy are still vulnerable to different mm-hmm. attacks. Like, just because you have a guy that's super armored... You know, if he's going against someone that has like an armor breaker weapon, yeah, he could he could be crit and or magic. Instantly. If they or if they don't have high resistance to magic, you might think that they're a tank because they're wearing all this you know yeah. armor, but then they get toasted by a spell. Mm-hmm. So you have to be always mindful of all the all those little elements. And those That's, elements were showing up in the bottom screen too. You had to click on every character, see what they were, look at their loadout, yeah. that kind of a thing. That is so tedious to me, and I absolutely <laughs> hate that element of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That it wasn't fun, and and to try to keep a hundred different things in my head all at once. It's just not the way I like to and, play games. And that's something, too. And this is, um, you know, again, the fact that Jim and I are um, seasoned Fire Emblem vets. We've learned through experience the things that you do and don't need to keep track of at any given time. Right. Whereas, you know, you're kind of expected as a newcomer to, like, okay, here's all the things I need to remember, and it just overwhelms, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, whereas, for, I can see that, for yeah. me, like, one of the first things I do in every battle is I just sort of, like, not even looking at the enemies closely. I just flip through and see a weapon they have. You have a bow, I'm keeping my Pegasus Knights away from you. You have an armor breaker, I'm keeping my armored people away from yeah. you. You've got something that's good against horses, I'm keeping my horses away from you. Um, and that's just something where, like, okay, before I even worry about the moment-to-moment decisions, I know that I'm not deploying these guys in this direction, for example. Um, and that's just something that's something I do at the beginning of every battle because it's a habit I formed yeah. through years of experience. 
And you know what? That that actually sounds a lot of fun the way that you say it. Mm-hmm. Um, I could see myself enjoying that once I had that literacy. But, yeah. Um, I guess my biggest complaint about it is that there's no real tutorial. It just kind of puts you into, well, into the fire mm-hmm. <laughs> to use exactly the right expression. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'd, I'd say the I'd say the opposite. Like I, like I was saying before, I think it's like very heavy on the tutorials early on mm-hmm. to the point where it annoyed me initially. Um, but I guess that's just because I have so much of an understanding of it. And plus, like you, like Chris was saying, you might have missed some of that mm-hmm. on the bottom screen. That also could be, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. I think they, they weren't... Like, there was that one thing where they taught you, like, okay, move here, select this to attack. Mm-hmm. The very basic controls. But then beyond that, they're kind of saying, okay, you know how to control the game, and from here we're just going to tell you things you need to know, as and, you need to yeah, know. Yeah, and they're basically just tool tips that pop mm-hmm. up yeah. consistently as you go through the first, probably the first, like, eight or nine battles or so yeah. are like that, where yeah, it's just which, you're constantly yeah. learning new things. Which is why I wonder if you might have liked it better to have started with an earlier game where everything is on one screen. So anything that's coming up as a tutorial, it's making very clear to you, like, you have to press A to get out of the screen yeah. that tells you the thing. All that out-of-game information. But yeah. the, the problem right. is you can't have it both ways. I mean, either this is a game intended to bring people into the franchise or it's not. Mm-hmm. And if it's a game that's intended to be, bring people into the franchise and I'm new and I tried it and I didn't like it because it didn't bring me into the franchise in a way that was comfortable, mm-hmm. it's a failure. Well, I mean... In that regard. I don't know if we can say. I mean, we can say that it maybe failed you, but like like Chris and I were saying before, it did actually. It had sold the most of any Fire Emblem. It actually did bring in a lot of new people to the franchise. Fair enough. But like like we said, I mean, it is also a niche. It is a niche genre. True. I believe it was probably more popular in Japan than it was here in the U.S. too. Mm-hmm. So I would say so. And in part because they have more of that literacy of anime and understanding of all those archetypes, and those are a bit more popular and that kind of thing. Um, and I do think that there's a, a lot of crossover in the Fire Emblem um, audience with people that still um, enjoy anime. I know, I mean, I don't really watch much, really any anime anymore. I don't know if Chris does either. Very occasionally. But um, I still kind of understand from just past experience, it kind of gives me a little bit of a leg up when I go into something like Fire Emblem Awakening. Yeah, that um, makes sense. And to touch quickly on the, the narrative thing, because you mentioned that, um, and we, we talked already about how the characters are very archetypal, mm-hmm. um, but I think one of the strengths of Fire Emblem's narrative is actually not the main stories, although some of them are more interesting than others, um, but the the character stories that you get through support conversations, which I don't know if in the time you played you got to see any of those. I did. Do they have a mechanical benefit? They do. Okay. Yes. Um, I didn't especially in this one. It's actually time. it's actually much more obvious in this one than it used to be because it'll actually show you the stat boost you get mm-hmm. and the fact that you can team up, um, like have them have two people fighting at the same time, which but, is a new mechanic to yeah. awakening. Yeah. Essentially, it's um, like the, when you when you get to, when you raise your support level with people in your team, which you mm-hmm. want to always do. Then when when they're close to one another in battle, they get bonuses. Or if they're teamed up, they get even more bonuses from being teamed up. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, and so the stronger the bond, the better the boost. Exactly. Yeah, and so you get these huge bonuses. And so you also want to pair people up if you think that they would be a good uh, a good match from just like fighting together. But also they have that element of when you hit S rank, they'll get married, and then not only will they have the strongest bond, but then they'll also have a kid mm-hmm. later on. And there's like this time travel element where your kids are coming through and then the kids share some of the stats and the last skill learned for both mm-hmm. both parents. So you can swap out the skills, so there's strategy there. So you can basically, essentially, it's like... You, you can make characters that wouldn't typically be possible. It's, Interesting, it's, yeah. assen- it's essentially um, a kinder, gen- gentler version of eugenics. In yeah. game, where you <laughs> Which we've par- yeah, in your past podcast. Yes, you're pairing people <laughs> off in order to get them essentially like, I just want... Someone that has these skills that can be these classes that can't that has these sort of a stats. So I'm going to put these two people together and just force them to have support S until they, you know, and have a kid that's going to be a super uber monster. It's and that's eugenics. Though. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, the problem that I had with the story really boils down to one thing: there wasn't a hook. There wasn't a story hook mm-hmm. that got me excited because I think the hook is basically that you wake up not remembering what's going on and who you are and it's kind of slowly discovering that yeah, yeah it's which, supposed to be which I, I agree with I actually agree with you on, on there not really being much of a hook because I felt the same way I felt like you know if it wasn't for me enjoying the mechanics of the series so much I don't think I would have enjoyed the game because yeah. the that story hook didn't that didn't grab me at all even though I did yeah. later on like some of the characters the, the past games you either 
in universe or implied are playing as the tactician and not as the main character. Like you are not the main character. This is the first time that's happened too. Hmm. Um, you're always following usually one Lord in particular. And that Lord is the central character of the story. Um, in Fire Emblem, um, Radiant Dawn, or Path of Radiance. Path of Radiance, yeah. um, The lord of the story is actually a mercenary, which is a bit of a twist. Um, but yeah, I, it, it's, there's still a central character, and it's their story. In this one, they're trying to figure out whether it's your story or whether it's Krom's story. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, from Krom's story, it kind of turns also into Lucina's story and all this different stuff. That's much later in the game. Um, but I think maybe there's the fact that you're not really invested in one particular person's story. Um, you're more... Like your personal story is mostly as an accomplice to Krom, whose story wasn't really all that compelling at first, at least. Yeah, I agree. Um, it, it gets better, I think, I, but it's not. It doesn't start off particularly no. engaging. I I thought I definitely thought the the Path of Radiance story grabbed me a lot faster. With I mean, it was it was just a simple revenge tale, but mm-hmm. I thought it was. And it then was it turns reasonably. It, it, well. it turns into something much more than revenge too. Exactly. Yeah. But it just, I'd already had that. And plus, obviously, the, the Black Knight kind of had, like, you know, Darth Vader mm-hmm. overtones. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Um, I think we had a pretty good discussion. So, fi- final thoughts. Doc did not enjoy Fire Emblem Awakening, but that's cool. He got to play a game that he normally wouldn't play. And that's, that's part of the true. fun of the roundtable is to assign games that maybe we wouldn't normally play. Absolutely. Like I did with Axiom Verge. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. That's, and that's part of the fun. We can talk about it. And we can, mm-hmm. we can you know, critique it. Mm-hmm. And we can say you're wrong. No. Uh, okay, so I, I think I think we're getting ready to wrap up here um, on another podcast. This was podcast number forty-eight. Chris, do you want to take us out? Oh, uh, you basically just did it. Oh, I did it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm Chris. Our, yeah, I'm Jim, and I'm Doc. And we'll see you next time. We want you to join the discussion on our website, backward-compatible.com. You bring a unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, tell us about your experience with Fire Emblem Awakening. What did you like about it, and what would you change? Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward compatible. This has been really hard not to do. Yeah, we'll cut all that out. But we'll leave that in. Actually, that will be the the, the opening uh, stinger at the beginning. It's just like you chewing on chewing chips. This has been really hard to do. Um, yeah, actually, that's that's a good. This one. week, Chris. Doc chews them up and spits them out. <laughs>